All right, welcome to another episode of Apocalypsis Historia, uh, episode four of our Shakespeare authorship series, and uh, we are on part what now three actually of just going through the uh, actual skepticism history of the authorship question itself, and uh, we got our trusty navigator, uh, cartographer almost now, right? Uh, uh, Chance Culver here, and uh, he's continually updating. If you're getting to watch it on YouTube, yeah, you're getting to see our cool little uh, flow chart we have here of, our, uh, of you know that way you can kind of see it visually and maybe see uh, you know the methodologies and uh, you know the splinter groups essentially all the the, the different you know uh, factions kind of you know see how they sort of you know one uh, interrelate you know not in just time itself but you know how. Uh, maybe even lines of thinking or whatever, right? So uh, yeah, Chance, uh, we ended with uh, your guy Stotzenberg last time and uh, lead us off from there. Let's see. Um, yeah, welcome back, guys. Uh, good to be back. Haven't recorded in a week or two. We've been uh, doing some other stuff. Been reading a pretty sweet essay about uh, the politics around the Essex Circle or the so-called Essex Circle and... Uh, seen some of the politics and Shakespeare and Daniel and Chapman and John Hayward uh, so I've been been digging that and uh, we're also gonna dig into some stuff here to uh, get set up for a few new installments uh, we want to do some installments about uh, other plays that aren't by Shakespeare from the era and uh, we want to do some other installments about you know who are some of these candidates that we're seeing a bunch on this uh, chart uh, but to go into today's topic, we're still talking about the timeline of post rat 40 and ideology and scholarship. Talking about the history of Shakespeare doubt, the history of this SAQ. Um, and as a lot of people have pointed out, especially people like Roger Stripmatter and uh, Alexander Waugh, big shot Oxfordians, um, they showed us that this doubt goes all the way back to the time of Shakespeare. But really when it gets publicly acknowledged and we're starting to get printed literature and people trying to make a living off of this question starts with Delia Bacon uh, no relation to Francis at least uh, as far as we can tell uh, she's an American we talked about that in episode one go check it out um, that's happening back before our Civil War that's happening all the way back in 1857 up here um, <laughs> my bad guys technical difficulties there we go I'm used to surfing around on my uh, illustrator page but we pulled it up as a pdf on chrome um, so we moved on from Delia down into Walt Whitman we talked a hell of a lot about Walt and his ideas and he followed along with what Delia was saying that we have a really really smart guy or a group of really really smart guys that are trying to write essentially what is propaganda, what is state propaganda, what is uh, philosophical explorations into how to work and run politics, um, psychological um, uh, investigations as to what kind of mind makes good leaders and what kind of mind makes bad leaders. And we see that especially in the history plays. And uh, from him, we get a whole splintering, from both of them, honestly, we get a whole splintering of different uh, schools of thought. And uh, I've updated this chart since last time to include some more minor theories that don't really get as much play these days, but I think are going to be relevant to our conversation in the end. So let's, let's zoom in on this color key real quick to really get a taste for how much we're looking at. And so, of course, we got our... That's your... Uh... Oh, you thank you. Uh, of course, we got our Orthodox Stratfordians, uh, in which we're not really going to show them much except to show when somebody's either influenced by them or part of the mainstream body. Um, but this gray color, that's our solo aristocrat theorist. Uh, this tan color, this is going to be our group theorist. And from here, we just have a rainbow of color up to a certain point, and we have to start coming up with weird colors. <laughs> Because we're, we're running through this rainbow to show a timeline. So Bacon's the first one that's pitched as a solo writer. And then we get Raleigh pitched as a solo writer. Then we get Darby, William Stanley. Uh, then we get uh, Southampton, Henry Rosley. Uh, then we get 
Essex, Robert Devereaux, and some of these don't last long. Some of these don't have that many adherents. Um, but you'll see their influence in other people's group theories. Uh, so I think they are relevant, and they may be relevant to our own research uh, down the road. Uh, we get Rutland, uh, Earl of Rutland, Roger Manners. Uh, we get Cecil, that's going to be Robert Cecil, William Cecil's kid. Uh, that's Edward de Vere's brother-in-law. Uh, Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. Um, let's see, Devonshire, that, that's a deep cut. That's the Earl of Devonshire. That's uh, Lord Mountjoy, a.k.a. Charles Blunt, who uh, marries Penelope Rich, a.k.a. Penelope Devro, who the Oxfordians believe is a lover of Edward de Vere and whom uh, the Dark Lady sonnets are about. Of course, we all know her as the lover of Philip Sidney. She's Stella and Astrophil and Stella. Um, so, yeah, she, she was apparently a super babe because all these cats wanted her. Um, we got... Keep talking. Let me blow this up. Just keep okay. talking. Yeah, seconds. we got the Florians here. Um, that's John Florio. Uh, that's always had a secretly strong following, and I think it's a, a super unique thing that I do want to dive deeper into myself personally because uh, all shout these guys the John Florio channel uh, yeah shout out to the John Florio channel by the way who's yeah she's been digging into all the Shakespeare connections with that alone right and there's plentiful so yeah um, seriously if you've never heard of John Florio check it out some of these people may just sound like a bunch of fuddy duddy English hoity toity aristocrats which you know most of them are uh, John Florio, he's he's his own little uh, bag of tricks. He's an Italian translator that comes to England with his father, I believe, and uh, uh, he's teaching people Italian. And so he's in these aristocratic circles as a tutor, and so he teaches a lot of these people and knows a lot of these people. Um, but he's popped up as a strong candidate. And uh, fun fact. We've talked about him a few times on this channel. Uh, he's put about a thousand words into our English vernacular. Uh, he's third only to Shakespeare and Chaucer. So um, he's got a large, large fingerprint on our language and our history. Uh, of course, the Marlovians, Christopher Marlowe. This is a big one because this is the first time we get somebody that's not directly part of this aristocratic circle. This is somebody that, yeah, he went to university, but this is supposed to be a cobbler's son. Uh, this is supposed to be just a guy that, uh, through his quick wit and his talent, uh, made connections and came up through the university. Supposedly maybe had some secret service connections, and that's how he was able to get away with not showing up to university for a lot of the time and still get his degree. Um, and yeah, a lot of mystery and skepticism surrounding that. Um, but yeah, he's, he's one of the biggest writers of the era that people say if Shakespeare never came on the scene, we'd be talking about Marlowe. So, uh, makes sense that, uh, maybe there's some connection between the two. Uh, the Dyerites, that's Sir Edward Dyer. Uh, only one guy really pitched at hardcore, a guy named Alden Brooks, who is a pretty good, uh, uh, literary historian type kind of dude, but, uh, yeah, he pitched Edward Dyer hard, and uh, it's an interesting one. But uh, Edward Dyer's connected to a lot of these guys. He's sort of the mentor of Philip Sidney and Edward de Vere. And so, okay, maybe there's a connection there. And then we get to some of the really new theories. We get uh, the Novellians, uh, or the, the Novellans. I, I, don't, I don't know uh, what would be the correct term. And some of these terms are mine that, that I've made up because I, I don't know what the correct term would be for someone that's a follower of Walter Raleigh. Raleighites, Raleighers, Raleighians, I, I don't know. Uh, so some of these are just my arbitrary names and, you know, bear with it. If you get a better name, shout it out in the comments. Um, but Henry Neville, that is a very, very new theory. That is the um, second newest candidate, uh, serious candidate. He's super connected with Francis Bacon. There's a lot of evidence on a lot of different uh, types of methods. So there's cryptographic evidence. Uh, there's uh, biographical evidence that matches up stuff in the play, stuff he did in real life. Uh, you know, one of the he meets a lot of the criteria for the the Shakespeare candidacy. He's traveled. He knows politics. He has um, history with uh, family history with courtly politics. Um, he's part of the Neville clan, which 
spans on into the War of the Roses. Uh, it's, you know, uh, Richard the Third and his brothers, um, they're all Neville's. Their mom, Cecily Neville. Um, and then we get to Thomas North and the Northians. It's Dennis McCarthy's the big uh, proponent of it. And while uh, there's a lot of maybe argument against it, it's, it's a pretty profound one because he's found that there's so much of Shakespeare that comes from Thomas North. And we already knew that. We knew that Thomas North's translation of Plutarch is what influenced a lot of the Roman plays. And there's a lot of lines and scenes kind of taken directly from uh, Norse Plutarch. Um, but what we didn't know is that there's a lot of stuff from like Norse journals and uh, uh, Norse other translations of other plays like Prince of Dial. And so uh, if you want to check out SirThomasNorth.com, uh, that's Dennis McCarthy's site, and it's got all sorts of quotes and parallel passages that are incredibly compelling uh, to show that even if Thomas North didn't write Shakespeare, whoever did write Shakespeare is super influenced by this guy and maybe has connections or relationships with him. Um, but Thomas North's a little bit older than most of these cats, so that's an interesting one. I think you should rename them the, uh, the Northman. The Northman, uh, yeah, yeah. I think from that one. Uh, and then the Pembrokes, um, and I, I should maybe come up with another name here, but uh, this is the Countess of Pembroke. This is Mary Sidney. This is Philip Sidney's sister. Um, and she's, I think, long been overlooked because she's a woman, and maybe there's a lot of women in this scene that, including myself, people are overlooking. Um, and so, But here's the thing. We know that she's a big-time uh, writer. She was a great poet. She is a patron of the arts. And oh, by the way, uh, Shakespeare's folio are dedicated to her kids. Like, hmm, hmm, that's a pretty good argument. Uh, so, uh, and her, her timeline like matches up really, really well with the Shakespeare chronology, at least with the mainstream conventional chronology. Um, and that's another thing that we can talk about in another episode is talking about the chronology because people of different followings here will want to put together the chronology of the plays in different orders. And some of it, I think it is, is up for discussion and question. Oh, well, you know, but you just said that just so like a weird interconnecting point because yeah, you're talking about all these different people and you just said the folio was dedicated to, you said Mary Sidney's kids, right? Or Correct. Or Lady Pembroke, right? Uh, but just, just even look at some of these names, but how are her kids connected to like the Edward Devere or connected to Devere or even some of these other guys? Right? Okay. Those kids like those kids like who's who's who their who are their parents and who are their cousins? Right? And you realize that they're all connected in this like little group right here. Absolutely. So uh, like uh, Mary Sidney, Countess of Pembroke, her kids, uh, one of them, her oldest boy, William, married Devere's youngest or second youngest daughter. Uh, so there's that connection. Um, supposedly, she had a fling with Walter Raleigh. Supposedly, she also had a fling with Essex. And even if she didn't have a fling with Essex, Essex's sister, who was mar married to this guy at one point, um, had a longtime fling with her brother. And let's see, her brother was also supposed to be married to this guy's sister, but this guy's sister instead married this guy. And, uh, yeah, we could keep going on and on. Like, this guy is this guy's uncle, even though they're basically the same age. Um, this guy is who the uh, Venus and Adonis poem is uh, dedicated to. And uh, there are a lot of Oxfordians believe that he's secretly Oxford's kid. Um, okay, here we go. Derby is the son-in-law of Oxford. Um, John Florio is supposed to have tutored Derby as well as Essex, as well as Rutland. Uh, uh, let's see, Thomas North's... And dedicated something to Sydney, right? Yes, yes. John Florio also dedicates... Almost all these guys dedicate something to Sydney. It's crazy. Um, What's funny is that you don't see... Yeah, you're jumping around. But one person, I guess, you don't see getting highlighted is uh, like Marlowe, right? Um, which is... Uh, yep. As far as yeah, being interrelated and sneak peek, you know, spoiler alert, maybe that's something, you know, we actually have some hot takes on, yeah. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, let's see, Thomas North, I can connect him too. Thomas North's nephew is a guy uh, named Edward Somerset, Earl of Wooster. Earl of Wooster 
gets married on the same day in a triple wedding as Edward de Vere and Anne Cecil, the sister of Robert Cecil. Um, and so there is a Thomas North connection back to Oxford there, and that's just one. There's probably others. Um, some of these guys, like Essex, and uh, I don't remember if Raleigh does, but Essex and Mary Sidney's brother, Philip Sidney, they fight with Oxford's cousin over in the Netherlands and the Low Countries, um, Horatio Veer, the, the the fighting Veer, who's maybe the basis of the character Horatio in Hamlet. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and then not to mention almost almost uh, all these people had spent time at the Cecil House. Um, some of these people were directly raised at the Cecil House. Uh, Oxford, uh, Essex spent some time at the Cecil House. Uh, Bacon spent time at the Cecil House. Neville did as well. Um, Southampton did as well. So, uh, yeah, there, there's, there's a bunch of connections with these guys. So let's, oh, there we go. That'll get us down there. Um, so let's see. We talked about uh, some of these group theories. And we started talking about a bunch of Baconians. Um, and we also maybe mentioned uh, the Derbyites. We got down to about 1900-ish and got up to um, John Stotzenberg. But before we get up to there, I do want to mention that we added some of these uh, other minor ones like Raleigh is a solo author and it's interesting uh, G.S. Caldwell is Sir Raleigh the author of William Shakespeare's plays uh, which was a short essay that comes out of Australia and uh, which is interesting because Walter Raleigh has tons of connections with America and tons of connections obviously with England um, and so it's interesting this is actually coming out of Australia uh, where some of these American authors um, are really into other people that never went to America. Um, so I think that's interesting. There's not always like a um, an ethnocentrism to, to these theories. People, you know, think what they think. Um, there's also the Southamptonian theory, um, which makes sense. Like, uh, to be fair, it's like the only thing that we have in print of all these cats. The only thing that we have in print that directly has Shakespeare's name on it with his name on it. It's like... Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis is dedicated to Henry Rosley, Earl of Southampton. Um, and so J.C. Nichol, who was a, a big fan of some of these earlier Baconians like Pot and Donnelly, um, used a bunch of cryptographic evidence to point out the Earl of Southampton was indeed Shakespeare. And uh, I'd like to get my hands on a copy of this to see exactly... Let me scroll over further down. Yeah, let me scroll a little bit down. Um... I want to get a, a copy of my hand, uh, get my hands on a copy of this uh, to see exactly how good the cryptographic evidence is, because uh, um, you'd be surprised how much the sonnets title page uh, gets used for cryptographic evidence, and uh, it's I don't think a fluke either. But you can find Bacon, Neville, Oxford, and Marlowe's names all in the uh, title page through different cryptographic evidence, and so. I wonder if the Earl of Southampton's in that, or if it's in Venus and Adonis, or what have you, because uh, uh, there's possible argument to make that uh, these different texts aren't all from a unified place. You know, we may have a compilation of different authors getting compiled because they're sharing a pen name or a brand name, or it's you know later retrospectively being attached to their anonymous, um, you know, nameless works. Um, let's see. You'll notice the uh, Raleigh theory hits kind of uh, an end here. We get a giant book by Henry Pemberton, who is an American, and uh, he fully develops Caldwell's theory, and he uses a lot of biographical uh, info, tries to attach it to the text. Um, he uses the sonnets uh, and uses plays specifically like The Tempest, Twelfth Night, and Hamlet, uh, tries to show you know, all the sailor uh, jargon that has to be from someone that's done a lot of sailing and traveling. And, uh, you know, I think that there's a, a good reason to attribute Raleigh, even if it's not correct. Raleigh was a pretty um, clever little poet, even if not a pro prolific one. And uh, just super witty, witty guy. Um, I wish I had some of these anecdotes offhand. Um, but some of his anecdotes, like, 
I think would even now like make people blush or laugh. Um, so even if he's wrong, um, even if there's no logistical possible way that it could be Raleigh, it's not the worst guess in the world. And uh, he's a super interesting character. So if we're doing more research into Raleigh, that's not a bad thing. Um, <clears throat> let's see. There's also the Rutlanders. Uh, the Rutlanders aren't a very strong group, but there are multiple Rutlanders. Um, so we get Louis Frederick Bostelman. Um, he is like the super fan of Roger Manners. He is absolutely 120. 3,000% convinced that Roger Manners is the solo author of Shakespeare. He thinks that there's a lot of influence from his wife and his wife's dad, which his wife is Philip Sidney's daughter. And so she thinks that uh, Roger Manners was super influenced by Philip Sidney. But to be fair, Roger Manners was born in 76 and Philip Sidney died in 86. So there's not that much time for overlap. But the two did get married young. And so uh, it's fair to say that Roger Manners probably knew Philip Sidney well and maybe looked up to him. Um, but Bosselman tries to cite a lot of like heirlooms um, that are in the family that would be inexplicable for how and why they have these things. Like on the back of some paintings are like an original ink, uh, some, um, some of the sonnets. And it's like, why are those on there? And so uh, at any rate, even if... Roger Manners isn't the original author of Shakespeare. He had connections to the original author of Shakespeare, so much so that they could memorize or transcribe them onto the back of super expensive paintings. Um, and um, also, Roger Manners has like a ridiculous resume of college professors. Uh, he studied under the likes of G uh, Giordano Bruno. Um, Who's connected with Florio? Funny. <laughs> yep, uh, and Sydney. Um, he studied under Galilee Galileo. He studied under Michel Montaigne, um, uh, as well as other really top of the line English professors, um, not professors of English literature, but professors from England. Um, and so there's so much learning and so much brilliance in Shakespeare. Possibly it's somebody that got to touch all these different modes of brilliance and compile it into one sort of literary form. Um, this, Lewis Frederick Bosselman was such a uber fan of manners that he wrote his own Shakespeare style play about Rutland being Shakespeare, the real author. And, uh, it's really an awful, awful piece of, uh, uh, literature and drama, but you should totally check it out. Uh, I forget. <laughs> Uh, if you look up his uh, Roger Manners, 5th Earl of Rutland, author of the works issued, um, it'll also have at the back of it attached uh, his play. Like he, he, he has to sneak it into his other works. It's pretty great. Um, I, don't, I don't remember if we talked about this too much in the last episode, but I can bring him up again if we did. Uh, Sir George Greenwood is the standard as far as um, anti-Stratfordianism or post-Stratfordianism goes. He wrote the book, uh, The Shakespeare Problem Restated. And he wrote several, several others, as, um, some doing analysis into law and all the lawyer talk in Shakespeare. Uh, but he did deep, deep research into the historical documents and into claims made by Orthodox um, um, texts. And he basically showed, look, we know nothing about the guy. Uh, what we do know doesn't really point towards his being in London or at the theater. Uh, the few documents that we have of him being in London are kind of late in his career. Um, so much of it could be pseudonyms, uh, paid frontmen, um, or perhaps uh, um, just coincidental names. We could have somebody that's an actor in London using the name. We could have somebody that's also in Stratford being the businessman, the two get conflated and we don't historically draw a line between it. Um, he doesn't state exactly why the problem continues to persist or why exactly it does happen in the first place. What he just shows is that it seems pretty darn impossible that the Stratford man could be William Shakespeare. Um, 
the author of the plays, at least. <laughs> the Stratford man is indeed supposed to be named William Shakespeare. That, that's not under question. Uh, whether or not he is the author of the plays, yeah, that's what uh, Greenwood's trying to show. And uh, so if we keep going down these lines, we'll see that some of these kind of dead end. We, we don't get much more Southampton, Raleigh, or the Essexians, which, yeah, let me talk about them real quick. Uh, Latham Davis, he's like the solo Essexian, which is surprising. Like, uh, once again, we don't get a lot of Southamptonians or Essexians, but I think they both have plenty of connection to the canon. And uh, they're both pretty darn literary guys, and they're both guys that absolutely loved the theater. And uh, so Latham Davis connected uh, Essex to it, connecting a lot of the historical plays specifically. What's full name, by the way? Uh, Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex. And so his sister is Penelope Devereux, a.k.a. Penelope Rich, a.k.a. Penelope Blunt, who is, uh, at least is a, in her youth, the lover of Philip Sidney. Um, yes, everyone, you have heard these names <laughs> over and over. Over and over, <laughs> yes. Yeah, hopefully it starts to sort of sink in and you'll be like me, where you're only half up mixing the, the, the first and last names. Is. And don't worry, we, we got some charts to help with that. Um... But let's see. Um, yeah, so it was trying to emphasize all the military experience that we see in the plays, um, emphasizing uh, kind of biographical information between the heroes of the, the history play, specifically Bolingbroke and then Hal, Bolingbroke's son, um, and showing the connections between Essex and those history plays, which even Orthodox mainstream scholars will admit that, like, there's got to be a connection between Richard II and the Essex uh, political agenda. He tried to supposedly rebel against the Queen and depose her, and he used Richard II as a form of propaganda to get people roused up behind that. Um, I don't think that some guy named uh, William Shakespeare Stratford was able to some some guy from way out of town come in and. Uh, in a few years, be good enough to write the biggest propaganda play for one of the biggest up-and-coming political figures in the country. Uh, seems dubious. Uh, so that's what Latham Davis is trying to show there. And uh, That said, it doesn't ever get much of a backing. We do see his name pop up again in group theory, but uh, not again as a solo writer. You got anything for this? Um, this might be a good time to... Uh, Talk about some of your uh, uh, quotes from your pirate. Oh, yeah. Well, as far as, um, yeah, the uh, overall arching theory, right? Because uh, we, remember, we're, we're talking about a very uh, tumultuous time period, right? There's a lot of power grabbing. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, because, you know, a unified England is not, you know, uh, there yet. Uh. And sorry, the reason I segued to his pirate book is his book is called Pirate Nests and the Rise of the British Empire, 1570 to 1740 by Mark G. Hanna. Uh, yeah, let him pull up a picture because the cover of it is Robert Rich, who is the nephew of the Earl of Essex. Uh, sorry, who is the nephew of the Earl of Essex? That's Penelope Rich's son. Um, and so we have... <laughs> We have a very literal connection here between uh, this is the Brady's historical about. pirate research and uh, our Shakespeare circle here. Um, yeah, once again, that is Robert Rich, the son of Penelope Devereux, a.k.a. Penelope Rich, which means he is the nephew of Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex. I'll tell you it was a better picture but yeah, this is the book. The book that I'm quoting from, and, and so, yeah, there's there's just gonna be so many fun parallels if if you know anything about, or if, I guess more for our American audience, or you know maybe if you're uh, from elsewhere, you probably see you know similar workings or whatever, right? Uh, but obviously, you know we're we're you know harkening back to more of that Walt Whitman, uh, Delia Bacon sort of uh, line of thinking, right? That we sort of talked about in the, the beginning of the series, um, and. Uh, you know, just once again talking about the time period and talking about how there's just lots of, uh, lots of, you know, uh, uh, like I said, it's tumultuous. There's lots of, 
you know, stuff moving. There's, you know, big factions that are being formed and all this. So Yeah, lots mm-hmm. of upheaval, lots mm-hmm. of um, fomentation, lots of uh, just change, um, revolution in, in the sense of change, not, not uh, you know, anarchy or anything, but, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, we have, uh, during this one portion where you have, yeah, there's just tons of pirates, essentially, that are raiding all the, uh, the buddies of, uh, are on paper anyway, of the, uh, of the English monarch, so they're trying to send around all these different people to kind of, you know, show them, show them who's boss and, you know, sort of, uh, uh, lay down the law, so to speak, but you're, they're, once again, these people, you know, they're not all speaking exactly the same language, all their law systems are kind of different, and so they're, they're, they're trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, combine the two, uh, and, you know, at the same time, and that's where sort of our soft propaganda theory comes in, uh, you know, easing people into sort of these lifestyles and sort of, uh, you know, kind of crafting... Normalizing it. Also, but also crafting an identity for them at the same time, right, with the, the historical plays and sort of, uh, like, we, you know, like we talked about in, the, in the, the Arabian Empire book of sort of creating that, you know, you know ethno-identity or whatnot, right, and you know, with a language being a vehicle for this whole operation, right, and so uh, I have uh, a few different uh, quotes here from this book. Uh, kind of talking about this exact sort of uh, idea. Um, so yeah, we have uh, page 31 here. Civil lawyers debated the sensitive question of aiders and abettors throughout the late 16th century that pitted the local interests against prerogatives of the realm. The killer groups helped force the issue, uh, these people that are kind of helping a bunch of pirates. When the Spanish complained that a well-known pirate sold purloined goods to the Kilgrews, the family denied culpability, compelling the Spanish to remind the Privy Council that the English subjects were forbidden to buy stolen goods. And um, so we have further here. The conflict between common and civil lawyers, between landed uh, accomplices in the West Country and the Privy Council in Whitehall, masked a deeper contest between traditional local rights and privileges versus royal sovereignty. Caesar, this guy who was he's like this sheriff dude sort of who was sent around to try to tell everyone that you know the king has all these powers essentially. Uh, Caesar argued for a balance between both types of law, but understood that this would entail significantly more royal authority than most Englishmen were accustomed to. Maintaining this legal plurality was a fundamental challenge for expanding empires. So many Tudor jurists looked back to ancient Greek-Roman models. The Roman Empire had claimed sovereignty over vast territories composed of people speaking many languages and practicing a variety of legal traditions. The Romans imposed a codified legal system over this diversity enforcing imperial civilization over peripheral anarchy. Not surprisingly, historians describe Roman imperial ascendancy's explicit correlation with the eradication of peoples deemed pirates, right? So it's like they're sort of, you know, drawing their boundaries, like, hey, you know, we, we conquered y'all for a while ago and y'all sore field too, so now it's time to kind of you know, really show them who's boss, essentially. Yeah. And uh, uh, get everyone, you know, you know, Trim the fat out of the people who are not, you know, not in line, essentially, right? Kind of, you know, whip up the middle class or their management class, almost, right? Their governor class. Yeah, like a, a centralization of social norms. Uh, and so here's the last little part here. And um, when Caesar circulated his lengthy broadside delineating the admiralty's powers in 1591, he implemented another form of crown sovereignty over the peripheries, the royal pro- proclamation. As opposed to a statute passed by parliament, a body representative of the people, the proclamation was the embodiment of the monarch, the symbolized by the fact that when the ruler died, the proclamation often did as well. The monarch used proclamations to legislate extraordinary and often temporary emergencies that were not clearly defined by statutes. They focused on, quote, military, religious, economic, or diplomatic, end quote, concerns, piracy being one of the most dominant. So yeah, if, if for people in America... It's pretty open-ended. Yeah, for, uh, for people in America that should scream, you know... Um, uh, executive orders, right? Yeah. Uh, as far as, you know... Patriot oh, Act. Or, yeah, or, you know, what's the first one? Truman is like, oh, it's a political... You know, we, we have to... I have to, you know, quickly declare this war. Yeah. Essentially, right? U- unilateral. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, lockstep, maybe, is a yeah. good word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, essentially, right? Uh, so it's interesting, once again, that, you know, this book is still... You know, it's kind of telling you, like, yeah, empires being formed here. This is, you know, literally what's happening. And, once again, our theory is that, you know, there's this high-class high, uh, you know, uh, very sophisticated language, you know, culture crap going on here with these sonnets, with these plays, and not to mention, you know, just the coalescing of Englishmen into a, a cohesive identity and legal traditions to have the language explained on, you know, kind of have the nuances, and also as they kind of explicitly 
or point out is that they like that plurality to kind of blur some lines sometimes too. Um, yeah, uh, it's very interesting to kind of see yeah, the, you know, trying to paint the, you know, when you take your Shakespeare class, you don't realize that the, there's a bunch of, you know, interesting pirate history kind of going down at the same time and uh, how it all kind of, you know, weaves in with one another. Absolutely. And uh, piracy can only happen when you have, like, long distance trade like piracy wouldn't work if if trade only happened on land it you have to have intercontinental or international trade um and the, this book also posits that the word pirate and empire also contain one of the same roots that p pira which means the seas or something it's uh, oh uh, no it's not here it's the one in this book i had it that way but uh yeah i thought that was another interesting little interesting little, little take there and of course both those come from latin back from the roman empire and um let's see we could keep going down here um uh, let's see flip it over flip it over here back to our charts um we can keep going on into the 20th century. I think the biggest thing that we can talk about, we can keep going with this group theory as well. Um, we talked a lot about Stotzenberg, and I, I, I love Stotzenberg because he's trying to tie all of it back to the Henslow Diary, which is really the best piece of documentation that we have for the era. Um, but right after Stotzenberg, we get this German guy who um, I really enjoy Peter Alvor as well because... He, he's super open-minded. He never feels fully convinced by any of the other theories. He really likes the Baconian theory. Um, he likes a lot of these candidates in the group theory, but he super likes the Southamptonian and, and Rutlander theories, and he's writing it pretty concurrently with Bosselman and Nickel. So I don't know that he's actually getting influenced by them. I think he may be coming up with his theory independently. Um, and uh, what's interesting about his is that he kind of splits the plays up and says, look, half the plays are by one guy, half the plays are by the other guy. And uh, there, that covers any questions. Like any, any issues that we'd have about Rutland writing X play, that means, uh, well, I can answer it by saying Southampton wrote it. And uh, any play that we'd say, oh, Southampton couldn't have written that. It's like, oh, but we know Rutland could have. Um, I don't know how much I buy into that. But we know both of them were supposed to have been known to just go and see play after play all day instead of doing their jobs, uh, being good earls, making sure that their estates are running and up to snuff and trying to make business dealings. They're supposed to have been just at the playhouse, you know, slowly getting drunk and enjoying play after play after play. And so it's, you know, uh, if guys like plays that much, it's possible they <laughs> wrote some plays. Um, let's see, Robert Frazier is another interesting one because he tries to do kind of a similar thing as Stotzenberg. He says, hey, look, we, we got actual documentation of a lot of plays. And a lot of plays uh, that we have documentation of aren't necessarily by Shakespeare, but they look darn similar to Shakespeare. Um so, like, there's a play in Henslow's diary called Caesar's Fall. Um, is it possible that that's what Julius Caesar is? Um, there's other plays like uh, uh, Titus and uh, Vespasian. And uh, is that possible? That's the same thing as Titus Andronicus. And uh, Robert Fraser builds up this theory, and it's, it's a little murky and uh, goes several different ways. But ultimately, what he thinks... William Shakespeare Stratford is, is uh, some kind of con artist, thief, businessman type that sometimes acts and plays. And so he thinks that uh, William Shakespeare Stratford is going around compiling a bunch of different plays that aren't written by him um, and getting them published under his name through his buddies who he bequeathed them to. Um, but he thinks that most of those plays are actually written by William Stanley Earl Darby. And so we get him connected back to the uh, Darbyite line. Um, and then we get some other interesting ones that I'll keep going on here and then we'll take it back to our other 
um, different theories. Uh, we get Harold Johnson's Did the Jesuits Write Shakespeare? And then we we really get to go down conspiracy ro road here because um, this isn't even him pitching some aristocrat author hiding behind a pseudonym. This isn't him pitching that uh, it's even the king or queen or that they had uh, secret children or something. No, he's saying that this is the church, um, the Society of Jesus, an arm of the church, uh, perhaps a now independent arm that's no longer beholden to the church. Um, they're secretly writing the plays. Um, and one of the things that he brings up, which I find uh, super interesting, is that did you know that there's only one English pope in history? Um, pope Adrian the Fourth. His English name was Nicholas Breakspear. Hmm. What are the odds? Uh, greatest writer ever is named Shakespeare, and only English Pope ever is named Breakspear. I don't know. At the same time? Yeah. No, uh, not at the same time. He predates him by about six, five, six hundred years. Okay. Okay. Uh, he's so interesting. Yeah. I want to say early eleventh, twelfth century. Um, I forget. Um, let's see, but. Uh, Moving on from did the Jesuits write Shakespeare, we get into some actual Orthodox Stratfordians, and they're 100% Orthodox Stratfordians. They're in academia, they write about Shakespeare, they do literary criticism, but they are interested in trying to deconstruct the canon. Um, they were known as uh, disintegrationists or deconstructionists. Um, they wanted to see just exactly what is and isn't Shakespeare. Um, and I think that's a pretty noble... Um, intention. I think the big complaint against them is that what they're essentially doing is trying to give the best stuff to Shakespeare and give the not so best stuff to the other guys. Um, which I do think is happening now currently in mainstream academia in 2022. Like We got guys like Jonathan Bate and Brian Vickers trying to give stuff to uh, People like uh, Kidd or Marlowe or uh, guys like George Peel or, God forbid, guys like George Wilkins. Um, which, you know, uh, I'm all for the idea that the uh, canon or folio is not uniform. I'm all for the idea, I think me and Brady both find that uh, you, you read one play and then you read another. It's, it doesn't always seem like it's from the same hand. Um, that said, I do not totally agree with this idea that just whatever is good must be one person, whatever is not good must be another person. There's got to be a more sophisticated line of thinking behind it. And uh, so far, what we see in mainstream academia, it's not quite sophisticated enough, no matter what kind of bells and whistles they have behind the curtain. Um, and so H.T.S. Forrest said that he thought the sonnets were written by five different people. It was a compilation of five different people's sonnet sequences and that uh, included the likes of John Dunn, Samuel Daniel, Barnaby Barnes, uh, William Warner. Um, I need to look into William Warner. Uh, haven't found much on him. But the other guys are pretty big names um, and that they were all doing it for a prize from the Earl of Southampton, which uh, I think people have debunked the whole poetry prize theory. But it's interesting to note that he thinks that the sonnets can be from multiple, multiple hands. And once again, he's an Orthodox Stratfordian. And then we get to James Robertson, who's really the uh, foundation of what I was saying about modern mainstream academia. He says, look, Titus, Henry VI, uh, all three parts, Richard II, Richard III are not by Shakespeare. That should be taken out of the canon. They're probably by Marlowe. Um, and while not a lot of people always give that to Marlowe, we do see some people in mainstream academia trying to argue that there is Marlowe and Shakespeare and that there's Shakespeare and Marlowe. Um, I think that partly becomes a, uh, comes from what we'll see later on here, the Marlovian influence. Um, the Marlovians have done a really great job in the last 30 years showing there's so much overlap between the two, it's ridiculous. Um, through style metrics and uh, just conventional parallel passage uh, type investigations, close readings, 
they've shown, look, hey, <laughs> there's so much overlap. Why, why make a distinction? We have a continuum from Marlowe into Shakespeare. This is all one writer. Um, and I think there's plenty of reason to, to agree with that, though I don't think that it's so uniform you can say that. I think that Marlowe himself is, is non-uniform. Oh, sorry, guys. I think Marlowe himself is as non-uniform as Shakespeare, and uh, it's possible that Marlowe is more than one author. And I think, I think a lot of people have actually shown that, that Marlowe's co-writing with Thomas Nash, and uh, we here think that Thomas Nash is indeed the same person as Thomas Decker. So Marlowe, whoever he be, is co-writing with Thomas Decker slash Thomas Nash, whoever he be. Um, and so it may be likely that those two guys are also in Shakespeare, but... Um, I digress. Let's continue with this chart. And, you know, it, it's a pretty epic chart. It gets pretty big. And look, we're only into the 1920s. And uh, I probably need to mention uh, another theory. Uh, we get Robert Cecil, who is the brother-in-law to the Earl of Oxford. Uh, Robert Cecil's dad was William Cecil, the Secretary of State. And he was the most powerful man in England for a good while during Elizabeth's reign. Uh, Robert Cecil himself becomes one of the most powerful men in England in uh, the late Elizabethan and early Jacobian era. And uh, his own personal timeline matches up really well with Shakespeare timeline and chronology. And there's a lot of biographical details, which of course are going to be somewhat shared by the Oxfordians since they have such a similar upbringing. Um, but there's a lot of biographical details that point to Cecil. Uh, like the Laertes and Polonius interactions in Hamlet, that's uh, Cecil and his dad. Um, Richard III as the main character, the deformed hunchback, that's Robert Cecil, um, which Oxfordians will use the same arguments. So it's, it's interesting that the same arguments can be used by two different factions here. Um, but let's move on to the Oxfordians. We've talked about them enough. Um, Clearly, everybody here is trying to find the right solo aristocrat. And it seems like everybody's just searching and searching. And yeah, you get a lot of people saying bacon, but for whatever reason, nobody, not everybody can unanimously agree on bacon. There's still so much other alternative thought. And so when J. Thomas Loney comes out with Shakespeare Identified, it seemed like, aha, we finally found our guy. And uh, since then, Oxford has become the, the, the favorite alternative candidate. I think even ahead of Bacon or Christopher Marlowe, Edward de Vere has got the biggest backing in 2022 and has maybe for a good few decades. Um, and it's largely on the back of what Loney does all the way back in 1922. And so uh, also check out the date. This is 100 years. This is 100 years exactly. So we're in the centennial anniversary of uh, J. Thomas Loney Shakespeare Identified, although it may be possible that it was uh, earlier published in 21. But this is the seminal Oxfordian text, um, and it shows that Oxford is the ideal candidate, not just that he's the ideal candidate, um, beyond pointing out that he's Shakespeare. We already we have a mystery already with Edward de Vere because he's supposed to be this great, awesome poet playwright character. We have documentation of that. Uh, it's in Francis Miris's Pallidus Tamia, which is one of the things we cite for Shakespeare. I want it, to clarify just because, yeah, we, you know, because they call it Oxfordians, but his, his real name is Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. Yes, the 17th Earl of Oxford. 17, it's a special number. You will see it pop up in Shakespeare, actually. Um... And so um, Thomas Loney uh, said, look, it's, it's not just that this guy matches up with Shakespeare. It's that this guy also is supposed to be a great poet and playwright, and we've lost all his works. Is it possible that we can put two and two together here? And uh, that's been an overwhel overwhelmingly compelling argument for a lot of people. I myself uh, came up through the Oxfordian school of thought. Uh, I've since uh, not quite apostatized, but... Uh, um, I have since distanced myself from the idea of him as a solo author, though I think he is very much at play here. He is so in intimately connected with all of this. Uh, and uh, the evidence we do have him as a, a poet isn't much, but it shows that um, he's super into the idea of poetry 
and uh, unfortunately, what we do have from from his juvenilia, uh, so we don't get a lot of his uh, poetry or playwriting from when he's an adult, and uh, because of that, it's hard to make a lot of internal readings. But uh, um, yeah, we will talk about him more in an upcoming installment or series, I believe. Um, moving onwards, we can talk about Devonshire. Um, this is what I find interesting. We got Peter Alver again. Wait, where did we see his name? Oh, he was up here all the way back in 1906 pitching Rutland Southampton theory. Let's see, he was up here in 1906 pitching Rutland Southampton theory. Let me take this for two seconds. Keep going, keep talking. And now we got him down in 19. 19- 30, uh, pitching Lord Mountjoy, Charles Blunt, Earl of Devonshire. And so uh, what I find interesting about Peter Alver is just how open-minded he is to um, finding different candidates and seeing, well, hey, maybe let's get all of them and then look at all of them simultaneously instead of doing this one by one saying, aha, I have it. Aha, I have it. Although I guess he himself is kind of doing, aha, I have it. But in, in the midst of doing that, I think he's looking at a lot of people side by side by side. And he points out that there's a lot of connections to uh, Lord Mountjoy, including the fact, the oddly coincidental fact that uh, William Shakespeare, or Shakespeare, the actor, is supposed to have lodged in London with a family called the Mountjoys, who were wig makers. Um, it's not going to be a relation, because remember... We have Blunt. His title is Mountjoy, but the family that Shakespeare's staying with, coincidentally, and that happens to be one of the only pieces of documentation we have is from a lawsuit against the Mountjoys where he's a witness um, from like 1611 or something way late in his career. Um, it's the Mountjoys, and so I, I find that name overlap oddly coincidental. Maybe that happens a lot in England. I don't know. Um, let's see. Moving on... Um, we get the continuation of the Derbyite theory with uh, probably the biggest backer of it, Abel Lafranc, a French man, and uh, he is just a huge fan of the William Stanley theory, and it gets a huge backing in France because it's so much diving into the th- idea that there's a whole lot of knowledge about the French court and the Shakespeare texts, and so who of these people, of all these candidates, had the most connection with the French court? Well, that, that's actually up for argument, but one of the people that did was William Stanley. And we also know that William Stanley had a deep connection with theater. His family, you know, had multiple, multiple companies. When His dad had one when he was a kid. His brother had one. Um, and then he got to inherit the right to have an acting company. And so he's got a deep connection with the theater. And so, uh, you know, it makes sense. Um Let's see, we get to continue on here with the Baconian theory, and um, uh, it, it's like, how are people still digging up more? So many people have already been talking about Bacon. Is there much more to dig up? Um, yeah, like, there's more to dig up, and there's also more to conjecture. And so um, we get the idea that uh, Bacon and Essex were the hidden but legitimate sons of Queen Elizabeth and Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, um, which is interesting. We had our Essex theory kind of die out, but it, in a way it's sort of getting rebirthed here with a Baconian theory. Uh, we get a version of a Prince Tudor theory that these are the sons of Elizabeth. Um, continuing on with that, we get Alfred Moody um, continuing this Baconian Tudor Prince theory, and it becomes like a big, big sort of foundational element, maybe not foundational element, but of one sect of Baconians, it becomes a foundational element to say, look, this is the Queen's secret son. That's why all this pseudonymity can work and exist. Um, And we see that in other groups and theories as well. We'll see that pop up in Oxfordianism. Um, I don't have it here on the chart, but we will see it pop up with uh, Percy Allen in the 30s or 40s um, saying, look, Oxford's the lover of Elizabeth, and they had a son together who was probably the Earl of Southampton. Um, what I wanted to show here with these Baconians, uh, look, we got authors like Rudyard Kipling and P.G. Wodehouse writing short stories that talk about Baconian theory. Uh, Rudyard Kipling wrote, wrote a short story 
in which some schoolboys discover the Baconian theory and then they immediately become adherents and they uh, kind of rebel against their schoolmaster. It's called the propagation of knowledge. Uh, I have not read that myself, but I would assume that either hints at Kipling's Baconianism or his anti-Baconianism, depending on the tone of the story. Uh, P.G. Wodehouse seems more clearly an anti-Baconian, but I wanted to include it on this chart. If it's so popular that uh, mainstream authors are including it in their stories, that's pretty big on a cultural level. And so P.G. Wodehouse wrote a story about a guy named Archibald who falls in love with a girl, and that girl's aunt is a big Baconian. And the acquaintance of the aunt, this, this uh, stiff dude named Algy, <laughs> Algy, right? Uh, he kind of starts growing more and, ba more and more Baconian as he tries to explain the theory. And uh, Archibald himself gets super bored with the theory and basically says, uh, I would do anything if I could cut this guy's head off with an axe. Um, so yeah, I'm guessing P.G. Wodehouse was very much not a fan of the Baconian theory. Um, and then we move on into Gilbert Slater's Seven Shakespeare's. And I've been trying to get my hands on a copy of this, but it is tough. I can only find collector's editions and the hundreds of dollars. So I have not purchased it. Keep trying to find an online edition. But Gilbert Slater is recapitulating De, Pi De Peister, De Peister, De Peister, I don't know how to say his name. Uh, James Watt De Peister um, was a Shakespeare myth, and it's all about showing that this is a group theory amongst a, a circle of people that are kind of in a, uh, a school together, and that they're coming together and they're in, in different uh, combinations of the group having priority and uh, screen time or page time, if you will, in different plays. And so, uh, um, you know, in one play, you might get 50% uh, Oxford and 20% Bacon and 20% Raleigh, etc. cetera. Uh, but in another one, you might get 60% Mary Sidney and 20% Oxford and 10% Bacon, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so Gilbert Slater said, look, yeah, I think all that's happening, but what we have is a scriptorum type setup, and Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, is the leader. I find that theory super compelling. Um, I don't know if it's quite sophisticated enough for what Brady and I are trying to attack and approach, um, but I believe that it's, uh, it's on the right track to showing, look, this is a bunch of different people's ideas being put together. That's why it looks so gosh darn genius. Um, but you'll notice we have a pretty big gap. Um, that's partly on account of my scholarship. I have not done enough original research. I've pulled a lot of this from R.C. Churchill's Shakespeare's and his betters, and that was written in 56. So a lot of his research is pre-56. So I got to do my own, um, post-56. Um, but that said, even beyond that, we do get kind of a lull in the conversation going into the forties and fifties. Uh, we get... Alden Brooks pitching the diorites. Um, we get kind of the big name theories. They get to keep rolling. Uh, the Baconians, they're still rolling. The Darbyites, they're still rolling. Of course, the Oxfordians are still rolling. Um, even group theory kind of keeps going forward, at least into the 40s and 50s. Uh, what does pop up on the scene is the Marlovians. And that is uh, huge. It's not huge when it pops on the scene. Calvin Hoffman's book honestly isn't too compelling or convincing, but it does open the door. Um, and you'll notice it, it comes all the way back from 1895, uh, German author Wilbur Ziegler. It was Marlowe, a novel about a secret society that included Raleigh and Marlowe, and Marlowe is the main writer of Shakespeare. Uh, Calvin Hoffman, he's kind of the first proponent of Marlowe's death was faked. And uh, there's pretty good reason to think Marlowe's death was faked. Um, I go one step further to say that maybe Marlowe's life was faked. Um, but uh, his death seems pretty darn bizarre circumstances. And so we'll see the Marlovians will continue into the future. I need to finish out this chart and get some more documentation of stuff that happens between 55 and now. Uh, but the Marlovians kind of stay strong, as do the Oxfordians, the Baconians, and the Darbyites. But as we get into the modern era, you'd think that 400 years would have been enough research, but no. We get new theories. Um, 
we get the Countess of Pembroke, Mary Sidney. She finally gets pitched as a solo author. Um, we get her in Gilbert Slater, but as a solo author, she's not fully pitched until 2004, um, which seems kind of crazy. Uh, we also get the very next year, Henry Neville pitched. That's a name that nobody had said. Nobody had said Henry Neville, not even in passing. And then as soon as uh, these folks looked into it, and they looked into it because they found cryptographic evidence for it, and they said, wait, why do we keep seeing this name Neville pop up over and over? What's it mean? And they said, okay, let's look into it. Oh, there's this guy, Henry Neville. Does he match up with anything? Oh, turns out he's Bacon's nephew, or uh, more like a brother or cousin because of their age difference, but... It's his nephew, uh, genetically and uh, by law, um, and they find, hey, this guy matches up as well as any of these candidates with Shakespeare's biography, with his timeline, uh, with his motivations, uh, with his thought process. It, and they show that Neville's a clever writer, uh, that he may have dabbled in some poetry, uh, he may have been known to frequent plays, so almost everything checks out for, the, for Henry Neville. And, that one's kind of mind blowing because, like, once I once again, I said we got four hundred years of this, and there's still people that are falling through the cracks. Like we've combed over this and over this, and we didn't weed that out. Uh, and so maybe with the dawn of the internet, we can weed out more and more, and maybe that's what we hope to do. I don't know if we're ever going to crack this code or not, but if we can add another name to the list or take off a name from the list, then you know we've done something. Um, and so. Last but not least, we get the Northians, or the, the Northmen, as Brady likes to say. And that's, uh, we spoke on it a little bit already, but Thomas North was the original translator of Plutarch and uh, several other texts that may have been big-time source material for Shakespeare. Once again, if you're interested in Thomas North, uh, check out SirThomasNorth.com. That's a pretty cool website. And... Uh, we get some of these theories going into the modern era, like up till right about now, like Alexander Waugh, you can go check out his YouTube channel. He's making videos concurrently. He'll drop a new one any, any day now. Um, as do the Marlovians, uh, there's Bastion Conrad. He's dropping videos every day. Uh, I don't have them listed here. Uh, but there's other people like, um, uh, uh, Roz Barber. Um, she's, a Marlovian that's still putting out stuff on her blog and on videos and at seminars and conferences. Um, and so there's several theories that are still competing now for alternative candidacy. Uh, the Baconians, they, they got, they got some crazy stuff going on. Uh, Peter Amundsen, uh, check out Shakespeare decoded. It's an hour long documentary or maybe a couple hour long, uh, documentary, and, yeah, uh, we had a shout out for that the second episode, I think. Yeah, um, what he does is so compelling that, like, if you've ever seen the History Channel's uh, Oak Island TV show where they're digging up treasure on Oak Island, it's largely um, credited to the research that Peter Amundsen did showing that there may be Shakespeare down at the bottom of that treasure pit. Um, because in the folio, he can draw a map and show you uh, by decoding and uh, cryptography and uh, uh, puns and uh, names and uh, drawing geometric maps in the folio, he can lead you to the Oak Island treasure map. So check that out. That stuff's wild. It's uh, super compelling. And even if it doesn't convince you that Bacon or Neville is the author, it'll certainly convince you that there's more to the Shakespeare story than than, it, than is shown. Or else that's just the wildest coincidence uh, that we've seen yet so uh um that's that's it folks that is the entirety of our shakespeare authorship history uh without me filling in a little more blanks between now and then and getting a little more than now on here but uh that's that's the basic rundown of of then to now and um uh we hope to maybe Put ourselves at the end of this group theory arrow if you draw a big tan arrow that goes straight down to 2022 i think uh that's where we would be uh though we're open to any or all of these theories at this point um some we find more compelling than others 
Um, that said, let's let me show you real quickly just a couple other charts we got here just to show you what we're working with. Because um, at some point, this isn't just a question about who is Shakespeare. I think there's a lot of poets and playwrights out here. Maybe not every name on this list, but I think maybe at least a few other significant uh, names, a, a significant amount of significant names could be pseudon uh, pseudonymous. Pseudonymous. Pseudonymistic. <laughs> Fake names. And so, um, um, yeah, going all the way back from George Gascon uh, to and Ed, guys like Edmund Spencer, John Lilly, George Peel. Some of these guys may surely be real guys, and maybe I shouldn't have them on this chart. And hopefully our investigations can help narrow that down. But some of these people are like, you'll notice there's like a couple people on here like, you get question marks on both ends of their life. Like, Samuel Rowley, ah, we don't know when he was born. Well, when did he die? Ah, I don't know that either. Uh, wish we knew. Um, there's there's uh, some people on here, like, we don't even know what decade they were born in. Like, Henry Porter? Pfft, ah, like, before the 1590s, I assume, because he would have to be a grown man. Uh, other than that, who knows? And um, You'll notice there's a few here that we don't know what decade they're born in. Henry Porter, Richard Hathaway, William Houghton. Um, all three of these guys are just names that we find in Henslow's diary. If we hadn't found these in Henslow's diary, I don't know if we'd even know who these guys are. Um, and so that I think that's interesting. Does that mean these are fake names or not? I, don't, I have no idea. Um, but it does mean that we have little documentation on them. And... Uh, that could be possible candidate for false identity. Um, but there's other big names on here. Samuel Daniel, who I hope to talk about a bunch in an upcoming video. Um, I won't spoil that, but uh, suffice it to say, I don't think Samuel Daniel is a real guy. I think that is somebody else incognito. Um, there's guys like Thomas Decker, which uh, I and Brady and uh, people that are better writers than me, like Donna Murphy, We'll say Thomas Decker is actually the same guy as, where is he? Thomas Nash. And so uh, we, we got other things like that. I personally wonder if, uh, oh, where is he? George Chapman might not be the same guy as Chris Marlowe. Um, there's a lot of overlap between those guys. Um, and then it goes onwards, though. We see this all the way down up into the 80s. What I do find interesting, none of these folks live to the closing of the theaters. So when the theaters close, all these legends are gone. Uh, so maybe the closing of theaters is not that big a deal. Um, move all the way down to this. So here's a timeline, a very similar timeline of candidates. And so these are a lot of the names that we've been seeing on the chart. Plus uh, any other candidates that maybe don't have their name on the chart, but possibly could be another Henry Neville type character that's like, well, look, we don't want anybody to fall through the cracks so let's just put anybody's name on here that seems like a, a viable candidate as far as this solo aristocrat theory is involved um, it doesn't necessarily have to be an aristocrat but there's got to be a connection to aristocratic dealings so folks like thomas lodge yeah he's gentry john florio he's i don't know what to call him he's he's an immigrant um so he's definitely not an aristocrat um he's not aristocratic from where he's from either so um and then there's guys that are like knighted, uh, like John Harrington and Henry Neville, but aren't specific, like titled people. Uh, John Dunn. There's guys like Barnaby Barnes, who's like the son of a bishop. Uh, so it doesn't have to be specifically aristocratic, but they got to have connections with the aristocratic world. Um, and there's some people on here that maybe are too young to be Shakespeare, but maybe aren't too young to be guys like, uh, say, John Webster or Cyril Turner or something. Uh, so we wanted to include that as well. This doesn't exclusively have to be Shakespeare candidates at this point. This can just be candidates for any of the people on that other chart. Uh, maybe it's as simple as we can just overlay the charts and uh, that person's that person. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? Um, but we can go ahead and call it there. Uh, any any uh, closing thoughts, Brady? No, just, uh, yeah, as far as uh, just getting to, like I said, see the whole progression of things and... Um, uh, yeah, I just kind of keep going back to, you know, some of those like little tidbits, you know, and just, I think 
as far as Stratfordians go, I think have the hardest time sort of explaining some of this stuff. You know, just the, like I mentioned earlier, um, the folio dedication and just how it branches out into all these different people and then, and like all these different people have their own like little, their own little branch, right? And they probably all deserve, you know, their own little investigation uh, or thorough investigation rather maybe, right? And yeah, maybe that's why we find, yeah, group theory to be so strong because you know, everyone, everyone gets invited to the party, you know, it's like everyone, it's like, yes, you were all right. Everyone, it's inclusive. Yeah, everyone, it's like, yeah, everyone had a piece of the puzzle, but uh, they needed Everybody to gets represented. Yeah, uh, everyone had a piece of the puzzle, but they were so excited about their puzzle piece, they forgot it was a puzzle. Uh, that's what I feel like it's, we've been dealing with here. And, uh, and you know, we, we saw, but if it's a group theory, then, yeah, try to figure out what's, if it's a group theory, what's the most compelling... Um, you know, version of that theory, right? Yeah, Obviously. like what? What? What is the connection? Well, why, in this why group? would they do that? Or you know, what? Why would they lie? Why wouldn't they take credit if it's the best stuff ever, right? And so that is a big hurdle for us to sort of, you know, I feel like uh, explain and you know parsimoniously. And and I think that's maybe one of the big flaws with any of these solo theories is that they don't have a full explication for the pseudonymous suit pseudonymity pseudonymity there we go um or the anonymity like why hide the name and they all have their own little quips and anecdotes for it but it seems rather circumstantial or coincidental um none of them seem like really compelling reasons some of them even seem maybe ahistorical um so like what what is the real reason for this anonymous authorship if Whoever you're pitching, why are they not using their name? Um, and secondly, I think all these solo um, theories fail to give any sort of methodology or format to talk about other authors that may be under the same pattern. So, for instance, like if uh, if we say that Shakespeare's not a, uh, the real writer, and we think that say uh, Roger Manners is. What does that theory do for the writings of Christopher Marlowe? How can that explicate the writings of Thomas Decker? Um, and maybe everybody's answer is, oh, I don't need to explicate Thomas Decker. Thomas Decker is Thomas Decker. Christopher Marlowe is Christopher Marlowe. And that's fine, but at some point uh, I find it odd that only one person ever did this. And <laughs> clearly there's so many candidates to potentially do something like this. Uh, so it seems to me that either this was never done, which I find highly doubtful, or that this was done and had to be done numerous times and not by just one person. And so maybe Shakespeare might be the, the biggest example we have of this or the most famous example or maybe even the most important example. But um, I would guess that at least one author on this list is not who we say they are. Like, is it, is it just possible that one of these people on this list, other than William Shakespeare, is also not the person that we think it is? Like I said, I, I've already spoiled it. Um, I don't think Samuel Daniel, Samuel Daniel. Um, it's highly possible that some of these people are real people, but are taking credit and getting paid to take credit for some aristocrat that does not want to put their name on it for whatever reason. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and end it there. Uh, but when we come back next time, um, depending on what installment we go with, um, we'll either be talking about uh, some plays that you maybe haven't heard of as much, uh, or uh, we may be talking about some potential candidates and going into detail about uh, which candidate and and why and uh, maybe even why not um so uh yeah stick around stay tuned uh we'll be back hopefully within a week or two at the most uh, gonna come back and hopefully start having some more edited video content for you guys and not just the loose podcast we love doing these loose podcasts but maybe some uh shorter content um if you got any opinions on any of this stuff please drop it in the comments uh, I'd love to get any kind of dialogue or discourse going about this. Uh, 
If you know any links or know anything, uh, donate your hundred dollars seven Shakespeare copies or whatever that book. <laughs> yeah, is. yeah. If, if you if you want to go and buy us and mail us a copy of uh, Gilbert Slater's Seven Shakespeare's, that would be lovely. I guess we got to get a kind of Patreon thing going so we can get some support here. Um, thanks for sticking around. Thanks for staying tuned, and uh, hopefully see you guys and talk to y'all soon. Keep uh, reading your Shakespeare. Yeah, like, share, subscribe, 